Back in the 90s, they sold a little plasticine Buddha. It's called a Buddha in a box. And it came with a booklet. Someone gave one to my niece in light of the fact that she had an uncle who was a Buddhist monk. And fortunately, she didn't read the book. It started out by saying how on the night of his awakening, the Buddha awakened to four wonderful truths. Loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. After reading this, I happened to go to New York, and I mentioned to the staff at Tricycle that they ought to run a review of this and point out how wrong that was. Those were not the four truths the Buddha awakened to. And they said they couldn't because the publisher of the, the little booklet and the maker of the Plasticine Buddha was one of their sponsors. So it got out there without any, any comment. And although the book was wrong, there was one way in which it was right, which was that the Four Noble Truths are very closely related to the Four Brahma Viharas. There was another book that came out decades ago, What the Buddha Taught, which was organized around the Four Noble Truths, but the author couldn't figure out how to fit the Brahma Viharas under those truths, so they're added as an appendix. But if you think about it, what would motivate the Buddha to teach about suffering, or the end of suffering, if it wasn't goodwill? That's what motivated him to find the, the path to the end of suffering to begin with, goodwill for himself. And then he taught because of goodwill and compassion for others. He had empathetic joy for all those who were able to follow the path. Equanimity in two ways. One to begin with, in his search for the path to the end of suffering. He realized that there were a lot of things he was going to have to do that he didn't want to do. As he told Ananda and a layperson one time, that when he realized he was going to have to give up sensual desire, his heart did not leap up at the idea. But he had to take an equanimous attitude being willing to look at the drawbacks of sensual desire, and he was willing to admit that, yes, so he did have to do this. Because that's what equanimity is in the Four Brahma Viharas. It's the reality principle. The first three are wishes. May all beings be happy. May they end their suffering. May they not be deprived of their happiness. But equanimity is a statement of a fact. All beings are the owners of their actions. In other words, if you're going to find the end of suffering, you have to follow the path, and you have to be willing to accept the path as it is. The idea that you make up your own path, or that you have to adjust the path to fit to somebody's culture, was not in the Buddha's range of thought at all. When he taught the Four Noble Truths, he said there is a duty. You have to develop the path, and there's a right path and there's a wrong path. And the rightness and wrongness are not dependent on which side of the world you're on. So you have to accept that fact. Because you have good will for yourself. This is why the Brahma Viharas go together. If you have good will for yourself, you have to accept the way things work, so you can take advantage of them. If you say, I'm going to wait until there's another causal principle that allows me to relax my way to awakening, you can wait until your dying day and pass many, many dying days and never get to awakening. There's a woman who came to see Lumpur Dun one time saying she didn't want to practice under our current Buddha, she didn't want to follow his teachings because 
look at the world. It's a very difficult place to practice in. Or as you wait for the next Buddha, it's going to be a world where everybody gains awakening very easily. And as you told her, if you're not willing to put any effort into the practice now, you're not going to have the right to be born in that world as a human being. If you want the practice to be easy, you have to be willing to put up with the difficulties. So that's what equanimity is for, to admit the way things are. So you can take advantage of them. You don't just stay there with the way things are. You realize that things have potentials. Think of the Buddhist teachings on the elements or the, the properties of what they call dhatu and pali. They're not elements that just sit there or properties that just sit there. They have potentials. They can be provoked. They may be very quiet for a while. But if you provoke them, they can become quite strong. Sometimes, as the Buddha said, there's so little wind that even the fringe of a thatch roof doesn't move. There are other times when it can blow whole houses down. Same with water, the same with fire. The world is full of potentials. The same holds true with your mind. We have all kinds of potentials within, within us. So when you're accepting where you are in your practice right now, that doesn't mean that you're going to just stay there. It means you realize, this is where I am, and I'm not where I want to be. So what potentials do I have? And you look for those potentials. They're all in us. And the Buddha described the qualities that led to awakening. Resolution, ardency, heedfulness. These are things that didn't belong exclusively to him. They're qualities that we all have to some extent. It's simply a matter of learning how to ferret them out, give them importance and develop them as much as we can. So the potentials are there. That's something you accept. And they're going to require work. That's something you accept as well. Because of that motivation, you have good will for yourself. You want to find a happiness that you can depend on, something that's not going to turn on you. There's so many things you can do in the world where, you're, where you, when you've done with them, you say, well, what was that all about? But the path to the end of suffering is not something like that. That's something that's going to be totally satisfying. In fact, it's going to satisfy you more than you can imagine when you get to the results. So you have goodwill for yourself and aspiring to that goal. Goodwill for others and the realization that in the course of developing that path and in the course of reaching that goal, you're going to be learning how to be more and more harmless all the time. There's so many ways in which people look for happiness in the world that cause a lot of harm. And because it's their happiness, they turn a blind eye to it. They're very irresponsible. This is a path with no blindness. This is a path that's responsible. It causes no harm to anybody in any direction. That's how you show your goodwill for yourself and for beings all around. And the qualities you develop as you follow the path. Generosity, virtue, meditation. The generosity is an expression of compassion. All the Brahma Viharas are there, embodied in your practice. But we go beyond the Brahma Viharas. There's a passage where the Buddha talks about how in the previous lifetime you happen to be a king. 
and the tradition within that line of kings was that as soon as you had your first white hair, you would abandon your kingdom, give, pass it over to your son, then go off into the forest and develop the Brahmaviharas. So he said he did that. He said, however, it, was not, it did not lead to dispassion, it did not lead to nirvana. The Brahmaviharas on their own are not a path all the way. They can be part of the path and part of the motivation for following the path. But this, is again, is where equanimity comes in, realizing that there's more you've got to do. Because the Brahmaviharas are fabricated states. And if you just stay with those fabrications, you're never really free. Freedom comes when you can look at the mind as it fabricates things and step back from its fabrications. We do that as we develop the path. As the Buddha said, of all the dhammas in the world, fabricated in nature, the path is the highest. But of all the dhammas in the world, whether fabricated or unfabricated, dispassion is higher. And the dispassion comes when you see that the best you can do with fabrication is to develop long-term happiness, but it's going to end. And you want something better. So you look at those fabrications and develop some dispassion for them. And through that dispassion, you see something that's unfabricated, which, because it doesn't depend on any causes at all, is totally harmless. And at that point, it doesn't require any effort. And John Fung said one of John Lee's most memorable quotes was when he said that nirvana is easy. Of course, he didn't mean that it's easy to get there. He said, once you're there, you don't have to take care of it. You don't have to look after it. You don't have to maintain it. It's there. So it places no burden on you, and of course it places no burden on anyone else. is something entirely separate and entirely good. Far, far more valuable than whatever effort goes into it, into gaining it. So even though the Buddha didn't awaken to the four Brahma-viharas on the night of his awakening, they were there in his heart motivating him in the, his practice, and then motivating him as he taught. They say that the Buddha, after his awakening, began to doubt whether it was worth the effort to teach or not. The commentaries stumble all over themselves, saying oh, he didn't really mean that doubt. He was just playing coy, waiting for someone to invite him. But I think he genuinely did have that freedom to choose. That's the point. When you're awakened like that, fully awakened, you have no debt to anybody. He was free not to teach. There was no compulsion in his teaching at all, because he had developed that compassion, goodwill, all the Brahma-viharas. He chose to teach, and we've been benefiting from that ever since. So as you practice, try to develop the Brahma-viharas as part of your practice, to nourish your motivation, but also as a reality check. Being willing to do whatever needs to be done. And if you have that kind of willingness, then there's nothing much standing in your way. <laughs>